Ah, the 80s. The years of big hair, big clothes statements, big weddings, big bands, big money, big movies and not so big computers. Today on Al's Geek Lab we explore the games of 1981, the year the original IBM PC was released. So let's rotate your Rubik's Cube, ambush your arcade, collect your Cabbage Patch Kids and pick up your PC DOS. It's time to get your game on. So it's 1981, you've just bought yourself the very first IBM PC 5150. It cost you a mere 4000 US dollars and you got some software with it like VisiCalc. But you wanted games, everybody wanted games. Even the boring business people wanted games. The problem was that this computer was brand spanking new. Nobody had the first Scooby-Doo about how to make games for this computer. So naturally, the games of 1981 on the IBM PC might have been a bit crummy. And when I say crummy, I mean absolute garbage. But anyway, you got a game with your PC and it was by Microsoft. It was called Adventure. It's a text game and it's a port of the original Colossal Cave Adventure which was made by William Crowther and Don Woods on the PDP-10 mainframe back in the mid 70s. So really it's not Microsoft's at all, it wasn't even developed for an IBM PC, but never mind. Over the next few minutes I'm going to be showing you the games that defined the original IBM PC in 1981. If you were expecting rich graphics, full colour, awesome sound or anything worth playing then you're probably sorely mistaken but it is worth a trip down memory lane just to see how far we've come. Stay tuned. So the very first game on our list is none other than Bill Gates and Neil Constance's donkey.base. What's more hilarious about this game rather than just its gameplay is the fact that IBM asked Microsoft to go and make some demonstration software uh, to show that IBM's graphics and sound capabilities and what came out of that is donkey. There's actually quite a lengthy Wikipedia article on Donkey.Bass where Bill Gates himself went in to talk about it. He said, actually it was myself and Neil Conson at four in the morning making this prototype. The IBM PC sitting in this small room and IBM insisted that we have a lock on the door and we only had this closet that had a lock on it. So we had to do all our development in there. It was always over 100 degrees. But we wrote this late at night, this little application to show what the basic built into the IBM PC could do. And so that was donkey.bass. It was at the time very thrilling. That sounds to me like Bill Gates making a hell of a lot of excuses again for making totally shitty software. A bunch of asses get in your way and crashing is inevitable. Some things have never changed at Microsoft. So the idea behind this game is that you press the space bar to avoid the donkey. That's pretty much it. Um, <laughs> it's, the funny thing about this game though is as simple and as crude as it is, it's actually quite good fun for, well, at least for five minutes. And just in case you had absolutely no life, have a Google and you can find that donkey.base, the original source code, is still available online for your perusing pleasure. Download today. Now the next game I had absolutely no idea existed. Made by Richard Garriott in 1977, originally on the Apple II computer, it got its MS-DOS port in 1981 and was effectively known as Ultima Zero. So if you're familiar with the Ultima games, this is where it all began. It's called Akalabeth, the World of Doom. And the story goes, in the land of Akalabeth, King Wolfgang had two sons. The younger one, Mondain, killed his older brother in order to get to the throne. Ah, oh, forget it. Who cares? He was discovered and disgraced. He hidden into dungeons where he kept plotting against the kingdom and later developed great magical powers. A champion of the kingdom, British the Bear of Light, defeated Mondain, or was it the stranger from future in Ultima 1? Anyway, since King Wolfgang had no more heirs to the throne, British became his successor. 
After the defeat of Mondaine, Lord British called upon several aspirant heroes to clean up the dungeons infested with the evil creations of Mondaine. And then you're left plumped in this game and you've got to look around for dungeons and stuff. It is a dungeon crawling game and it's a sub-genre of the role-playing games that became pretty much what RPG games are known for today. Now this is the original 1981 version you're seeing here. There was an updated version made many years later by Fanbase in 1996 which included colours and background music as well as a compass. Woohoo! Anyway, um, it's, it's pretty tough, the controls are just weird. Although most games at the time were. On the PC you move up, down, left, right with the cursor keys, that's okay. And then you press Z and you get the character statistics. Uh, you can press either the X or the E key to climb a ladder or a hole, which will enter the town, the dungeon or a castle. You can press space bar to pass a move. And uh, yeah, well you, can, you can actually save and restore a game as well, which was a really big deal for 1981. Now I know when you look at these dungeons, and this sort of wireframe 3D type graphics, you might go and wince today. Uh, but just bear in mind that um, we've got other examples of games here, uh, such as Donkey. And if you compare the capability in this game, the fact that it's got a lot to it, there's a lot of things going on, and effectively there is kind of 3D graphics here, it's actually got quite an immersive uh, inf interface to it. It's, it's a game, it's got a story, it's got uh, you know two types of land, it's got the, the, the overland where you move about and you do things and then you go onto the dungeons and you kill things and use potions and all sorts of stuff. So it was quite involved for 1981, however unfortunately for me this game bored my tits off. Now, this next game, Set the Hostages Free, version 2.0 by Texasoft. Now, I don't know what happened to version 1.0. I'm presuming that it was so unquestionably shit that they decided just to make the public release a version 2.0. And when it gets to version 2.0, it's not much better. Uh, there's a big grey box then you've got blue bits inside that and then your hostages are inside the blue bits and of course the kidnappers are probably the grey bits and then there's black boxes where the kidnappers aren't at presumably and so you have to shoot through the bits where the kidnappers aren't at and then if you keep shooting through that little bit then you can make a passageway for the hostages to get out. And of course the hostages are so frickin' dumb that only five can come out at a time. So you've got to go along to the next part of the wall where the hostage might not, uh, the kidnapper might not be, and then do the same again. And then the hope that one of the snaky looking things don't get you at the same time. And of course the snaky things are quite difficult to get past. And so the likelihood is you're never going to win this game. And even if you could win this game, you wouldn't want to because you'd be sticking forks in your eyes. And that's all I have to say about Set the Hostages Free by Texasoft. Don't play it. This game is called Intercept. It's a text adventure, but it's got a little sort of box thing where you can see all the different things, like your inventories on your right hand side, your command interpreters on the bottom, and then the little uh, text box of what's going on is on the left hand side. So it's all kind of split up in a nice way, so you're not always looking uh, just at a command line where you're typing commands in, like I guess games like Zork. The aim of the game is it's a spy game. I don't really know how to finish the game because I haven't played it all the way through. Spoiler alert. Uh, but you're Agent 68 and he's supposed to guide you all the way through. It takes two word commands all the way through so you're hopeful that it isn't that difficult but unfortunately as you go along you'll see that the fact that it's only a two word interpreter makes things a little bit difficult. In fact some of the commands are downright infuriating as you'll see on the examples here but it does start to get fun there are lots of little things in about the story which you may enjoy definitely one of the better text adventures from this era 
somewhat like Interceptor, The Miser's House is a text adventure. But in this text adventure, don't expect any fancy interface. Oh no, this one is pure text. Now, you, um, you have basic commands as well, like there's only two word commands. The only interesting thing to say about this game is that you can complete it in about 45 minutes. Your maximum score is 100 and there's pretty much no story. So, yeah. Star Trek. What am I going to say about Star Trek? This is the port from the mainframe and it came over to the PC and it's pretty much the first ever DOS game that ever came out that featured Star Trek. That's all I really want to say about this. It's terrible. So, like, if you want to transfer from one area, from one quadrant to another, you've got to figure out which number to type in. And, yeah, the number is like a one from eight thing and, like, it's kind of backwards it's like anti-clockwise and you've got no idea that eight means forward and three means to the right and ah oh my god this is just an awful awful thing it's just really difficult to get the grips off i guess you could probably get there in the end but don't let the cutesy sound effects and the nice ascii graphics get you on this one it's not worth it the mesmerizing graphics, the awesome sounds, the nothing of B1 Nuclear Bomber. This is a game uh, produced by Avalon Hill and basically you have to fly a B1 bomber and destroy certain targets. You input the commands to control your bomber's altitude, the course, the radar, weapons and so on. and so boring. Yes, this is the oldest version of chess for the IBM PC ever made. It was made in March of 1980 and then converted to the PC in 1981. Because it was one of the first games, it of course is text-based like many of the other ones. The chess board and the PCs are drawn with ASCII characters, and it's no surprise the user input is also based just on keyboard commands. There is no multiplayer mode, you play against the computer, and as usual, you can select the AI skill level. The game offers 24 difficulty levels and is pretty much chess. It's not bad, it's not great, it's just chess, and I can't play it. And finally, for the very last game of the review of 1981 on the IBM PC is none other than Soft Porn Adventure. Now, okay, yes, it's another text adventure, but this is probably the favourite game of many an IBM PC owner in 1981. The game was originally created by Charles Benton and was released by online systems, which later became Sierra Online. And years later, the soft porn adventure inspired Leisure Suit Larry in 1987, a series of adult-oriented video games. So it changed out the text partially for a graphical game, but goodness me, this is where it all began. And if you have played this game, you'll see that the story inside Leisure Suit Larry in the Land of the Lounge Lizards is pretty much the exact same. Chuck Benton, the guy who wrote the game, actually wrote it for the Apple II in 1981 so that he could teach himself Applesoft Basic. He never actually intended it to come out as a commercial game, but of course, luck would have it. His friends at Online decided to make a box, an advert, and the cover of the box had a hot tub which was at Ken and Roberta Williams's house. From left to right in the hot tub were Diane Siegel, online's production manager, Susan Davis, online's bookkeeper, and the wife of Bob Davis, the creator of Ulysses and the Golden Fleece, Rick Chipman, and an actual waiter from a local restaurant called The Broken Bit, and of course Roberta Williams, all considered probably at the time to be quite upstanding citizens. Soft porn was withdrawn from sale after a few months. Customers asked for a version for women, but Benton could not find a female collaborator. He worked on other Sierra games until leaving the company in 1985 to found Technology Systems Incorporated. 
So, despite it being lewd in nature, it was still quite a bit of fun. That was soft porn, and that's the final game of the review of 1981 on the IBM PC. Next time, of course, I'll be reviewing the top 10 games of 1982. I didn't think it was worthwhile doing a top 10 on this one, because there really only was around 10 games in 1981. Regardless, if I have forgotten any games from 1981, or if there is a game out there that is much better than all of these, or if I've been particularly nasty to any of these games, then please let me know in the comments. Thumbs up, hopefully, or thumbs down. And of course, and if you like the things that I do, then please press that subscribe button. I really, really love it when you guys do. Anyway, that's it for me. I will see you soon in 1982. Until then, have a great evening and take care of each other.